Luke chapter 13, looking at the first nine verses. Many of you guys know the, the country of Haiti. Haiti actually became Latin's, Latin America's and the Caribbean's first independent state of the colonial era and the first black-led republic when it threw off French rule in the 19th century. Since then, though, Haiti has had a tragic history of turbulence, violence, economic and political unrest, and natural disasters. Plenty of beautiful people and things have happened in, in Haiti, but from a, just a macro scale, a lot of turbulence have happened. Some, and I'm not a history expert from just from reading, some of this is due to a history of economic and military abuses by the French and, U and the U.S. and others, some of their own doing, some just natural disaster. I was just going to read just a kind of brief history of some, or some, of, of some events that's happened over the years. I'm not going to obviously list every event. I'm going to uh, you know, skip sections of time here. But in 1825 here, despite ha Haiti gaining independence, um, in 1791 and having their own constitution in 1801, France only recognized the Haitian independence uh, in 1825, but it imposes harsh reparations on its former slaves and loss of income. Even though they're the one who were colonized and, 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 and put them in slavery, they actually demanded reparations for that lost income in slaves. Those loans Haiti takes with the French banks uh, it took forever to cover the debt. It took a long time to cover a debt. And, and with subsequent interest, they're only able to repay that in 1947. 1915, the United States invades Haiti, withdraws in 1943, but keeps financial control and political influence. 1937, in, in the worst incidents of a long standing rivalry with the neighboring Dominican Republic, Republic, thousands of Haitians in a border area massacred by Dominican troops under the order of dictator Tru. Trujillo. In 1957, a, the, uh, the uh, famous uh, dictator Papa Doc uh, takes power with military backing, ushering in a period de uh, defined by widespread human rights abuses. His son is succeeded by him, John Claude, or Baby Doc, they called him, but repression increases. In the following decades, thousands of Haitian uh, people flee to, to Florida, many dying on the way. Let's fast forward sometime to 2008 to 2010. There's a lot of protests triggered by food shortages, cholera outbreak, and electoral disputes. Some of you guys remember 2010, an earthquake uh, ransacks uh, Haiti, and up to 300,000 people die or killed. Despite international relief effort, the country is all but, uh, all but overwhelmed, exacerbating political and social and economic problems. 2016, Hurricane Matthew kills more than 850 people, leaves tens and thousands homeless. 2021, this last year, their president that was elected is shot dead after government, uh, government opened fire with assault rifles in his private residence on July 7th. And then just a month later, a little over a month later, 2021, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake strikes western Haiti, causing high casualties, over 300 plus people killed, hundreds more injured, not to mention all the structural damage. I mean, they just can't catch a break with so much tragedy and turmoil. And it's easy to look at the history of tragedy and, on, and unrest and think, why did God allow this to happen to these people? Common questions many people ask when disaster strikes. Did they do something? Did, did they do something that, you know, why did, why did God allow this to happen? Did they do something that makes them more deserving of this? Was this part of God's judgment on them for some sin that we are unaware of? The people who died in 9-11, why did they die like that? Was it due to their personal sin? Hurricane Katrina, the Titanic, you name the tragedy. Was this a form of judgment on them because of sin? Why would God allow it to happen? Naturally, we have all types of questions when tragedy strikes, and one of the main persisting questions is why. When, 
When tragedy strikes, when tragedy hits us and other people, one of the persistent questions is why? Is, some, is it something that I did or this person did that God allowed this to happen? Some people in our narrative this morning in our text bring up a recent tragic situation that happened and wants Jesus' thoughts on it. Maybe they want to make sense of it, the tragedy, or, or really to confirm why these people confirm in their mind why they think these people died in such a tragic way. And Jesus does not answer the questions of why it happened, but instead wants them to focus on a much more important reality. There is actually a greater calamity than physical death coming for all those in this life, no matter who they are, unless they, re they respond to my urgent call to repent. Spiritual death and calamity is hitting all of your way unless you repent. You know, one of the themes that we said earlier that Jesus has been hitting on the last few sermons throughout chapter 12 is, is respond to urgent response to the gospel message in light of his return, in light of his coming judgment, in light of even positively his coming reward for faithful servants. Today the text continues that theme of an urgent response, but in the context of a real life historical event that all his hearers would have related to. In fact, they're the ones who bring this up to Jesus to get his response to the tragedy. I think one of the main, th the main things that we see in our text is that we must all repent as soon as we are able or face the certain judgment of God. Another thing, main thing we see is that the time is now to repent because you do not know when death and judgment is coming for you. And there are plenty and throughout Luke and throughout the Gospels, there are plenty of, of peaceful, warm and, and invitations to, re, to respond to the Gospel, right? Come unto me, all you who are, uh, who, who are, are, are uh, what's the word I'm looking for? All you are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, right? He, he promises eternal life. He promises peace. But here, we see that the, uh, there's an urgent call based upon coming judgment, based upon coming perishing. And the first thing we see is the necessity of repentance for, listen, everyone. Let's start in verse 1. Everybody, if you can look at the text here, it says, There were some present, there were some present at, the, at the very time who had told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So history records that Pontius Pilate could be very ruthless and cruel as Rome appointed governor of that Jewish province. The Jewish people despised him, and some people I heard it, uh, say that one of the reasons he gave into Jesus being allowed to be crucified because it was kind of could have been an angle to keep peace and get back into the graces of the Jews. Apparently, though, he was so corrupt that even sometime after Jesus was was crucified and risen, Rome dismissed him from his position because of the, uh, his abuses of the office really threatened or at least greatly annoyed the imperial government of Rome. He was not a good ruler. He was not a good guy. He was not well liked. It is no wonder a story like this happened. Now, we don't know all the details of this. In fact, um, there's not that we know of a, uh, a exact extra biblical like historical uh, reference that corroborates this, but we know it happened because it's in the biblical text here. But it seems the Galileans are making a ritual trek to Jerusalem to worship and offer sacrifices in the temple. Most people believe that this was the time of the Passover. In the midst of making sacrifices and offering worship, they were killed by the command or approval of Pilate. I don't know if they were suspected of being zealots or making a pro or they're going to make a protest, but killing people in the temple while they're offering sacrifices to God is heinous. Pilate greenlighted their brutal murder. Not only, not only that, but in this brutal murder, their blood was mixed with the blood of sacred animal sacrifices. Now, it's hard to imagine this kind of layer of offense here for us. You know, I'll try to think of something that would connect it, but, you know, you maybe think of the nine 
victims in uh, that Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston 2015 getting slaughtered in a prayer meeting in a racist, heinous hate crime. And that feeling's like Mr. many of us were, were, were angered and we're saddened, right? These people are worshiping and they're praying in peace and someone kills them. In fact, the killer said that I almost didn't do it because they were so nice to me. And maybe you remember your feelings of anger and hurt and frustration. But this tragedy was not at the, was not at the uh, hand of some lone depraved killer, but the hands of a corrupt government, a corrupt leader, who called for this atrocity. This tragedy was deeply felt by people as heinous, blasphemous, shameful, and a sacrilegious offense. Utter disrespect for their lives and utter intentional disrupt of disrespect and, and disregard for the worship of God. It was truly maddening, heartbreaking, and made the Jews think, why did this happen to these Galileans? Is God judging them for something we don't know about? I mean, to die like this? I mean, they are Galileans, and you know how they are. You never know what, you know, uh, you know, they could be doing. So they bring this tragedy to Jesus to get his thoughts. Notice how Jesus answers. Look at verse 2. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way. He does not give them the answer that they were probably expecting, but confronts the wrongful thinking behind they, why they brought this uh, 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 tragedy to Jesus in the first place. That is, thinking that people who suffered this atrocity were somehow worse sinners than others. Jesus says in verse 3, no, unless you repent, you will also perish. This would have been a shock to them, and they really should be just get, be used to being shocked by Jesus' answers by now. You can just imagine a press conference or something like that, and, and people ask Jesus, hey, why did this dictator kill all these people? Why did this earthquake, why did this hurricane happen? Jesus is like, hey, unless you all repent, you're going to perish also. Woo, click, click, click. It have been all over the news. You know, they, 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 were, they were shocked. Jesus gives another example to drive the same point home in verse 4. Look at verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Jesus like, well, you mentioned the Galilean victims of Pilate. Jesus says, what about the Jerusalem victims that were killed by the Tower of Siloam? Close to their home. Many scholars believe that this tower stood at the juncture of the south and east walls of Jerusalem, probably fell during construction of an aqueduct uh, from the reservoir of Siloam that was going to improve uh, water supply. So it just fell under construction. This tower falls and kills 18 people. Family members, friends, horrible tragedy. Jesus says, when you heard about this tragedy, did you think that they were somehow worse sinners than other people living in Jerusalem. Well, you would be wrong again, because I'm telling you that unless you repent, all of you will perish as well. Instead of Jesus expounding on why these tragic events happened to those people, he corrects and confronts a faulty assumption behind why they brought this event up in the first place. He, God, knows what they're thinking, and that is what, uh, and, 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 and what, and why, what they think and why they think this tragedy it, what took place. And that's probably, um, and then you see Jesus confirms that in what he says. So Jesus says, hey, do you think these Galileans are worse sinners than all the other Galileans or, or people in Jerusalem that were crushed by this tower worse than everybody else in Jerusalem because they were killed by killed by this. This is exactly how they were thinking. That was actually the prevailing, prevailing thought at the time. Your amount and level of sin was directly related to the suffering that you endured. And we see this brought out uh, in John, pa Pastor, Pastor Wade preached this, John chapter 9, disciples see a blind man from birth, and what do they ask? Is the reason that this person is blind and suffered this way, is it because of that man's sin? <laughs> or the sin of his parents. They don't even give an option, like maybe this just happened, right? They don't, it was just, it's either his fault or the fault of his parents. This was embedded in how they, in how they thought. So these people died tragically, 
So if these people died tragically, especially in a grotesque way like this, it had to be because of some egregious sin in their life. This is also the mentality of Job's friends as we were learning about. We saw in Job 4-7 when the, when the friend says, remember who that was, remember who that was innocent ever pairs, or where were the upright cut off? Basically, come on, Job. Tragedies like this do not happen to innocent people. You're guilty somewhere, just confess. Before we uh, you know, address Jesus' mayor point he is driving home, one thing we should take away is that horrible tragedy is not always an indicator of egregious sin causing that tragedy. Whether that suffering happens to you or someone else. Now, it is true that all sin, suffering, sickness, tragedy in this world happens because of the presence of sin. The world we live in is deeply affected by the fall, all right? Adam and Eve, you, you know, messed up everything, right? Even creation. But not every tragedy happens to, that happens to a person is a direct result of that person's rebellious sin that brought it on. Many of God's people face tremendous suffering, and there's no sign of, like, unrepentant sin causing that suffering. The book of Job makes it clear that, that, clear that this wasn't because of his sin that brought on, this, uh, that, you know, brought on all this, uh, tr- these trials. Christians suffer unspeakable suffering. You think about all these missionary stories where, where the missionaries doing God's will were killed. Christians and, other pe- and all types of people suffer uh, at the hands of the state. Natural disaster, terminal sickness. And we know it wasn't because of sin on their part. Sometimes tragedy strikes in God's loving sovereignty, and it's just not healthy to just be always consuming your mind of did this happen because of sin. Listen, we know as God's people, God does discipline those he loves, and and sometimes it is a result of sin. We need to say, search me, O God, but it's unhealthy to be consuming your mind that God judged me because of sin when you're trying to walk with him. Sometimes it's a trial that God's using to grow you. Sometimes we don't know why this tragedy happens. And part of what Jesus wants us to realize here, it is really by the grace of God that none of us has not already been punished because of our own sin. A question people often ask today is, why do, you know, bad things happen to good people? And I like what I think it was R.C. Spro uh, uh, said, when we understand the holiness of God and the evil of our sin, we should be asking, why do good things happen to, uh, to bad people at all, Right? Why has God not immediately judged us for our rebellion? And that brings us to what Jesus is more clearly addressing in in, in verse 3 and verse 5 in this text. That is, we are all sinners destined for judgment, spiritual death, and calamity. We must repent of our own sin or we too will perish in judgment. Again, looking back at our text, Jesus does not answer whether it was due to to sin that these people were killed in this way. But it says, you are no better than any of the people who were tragically killed. So if you think they died because of their grotesque sin, the question should not be why did they die, but rather why did I and my own sin not be judged also? Our sin before God is just as worthy of divine judgment as anyone in the world. Unless you repent, there's coming a day when you will perish as well. It might not be when a tire falls on you or a bridge collapses or you getting killed by the state or some hurricane or something like that. You could live a relatively old age. But if you fail to repent, you will perish eternally. Now, some think... Jesus is referring to Jerusalem when it's destroyed in AD 70, and it, could, and it could be alluding to that in some degree. But the ultimate day that Jesus is referring to is the day of judgment when God sentences all unrepentant sinners to perish in eternal judgment in the lake of fire. Jesus is actually graciously letting them know that, hey, all you are worrying about the wrong thing here. You are in the same boat, and it's only God's mercy that you are still alive, but there is coming a day, well, that is not going to be the case. 
Sin will be the reason for your perishing, perishing if you do not repent and put your faith in me. Do not let the fact that that tower of Siloam did not hit you make you think that you are right before God and safe from God's judgment. You must also repent unless you will eventually perish. This message of this urgent need to repent before we face judgment is Christ's message for us as well. There are many people who are victims of awful tragedies in our day. Execution because of their faith. That's happening now, today. People who are, uh, you know, die in car, car crashes, dying of cancer. You know, COVID affected everyone. Tornadoes, hurricanes, victims of gun violence. Let's not be misled in thinking that because we have been spared tragic death and atrocities, we are innocent and safe from God's judgment. Things could be going well for you. Good health, full bank account. That is not a sign that you are right with God. Neither is suffering a sign that you are not right with God. Repentance of your sin is the sign that you are right with God and free from his covenant coming judgment. Listen, the, f the fact is that having your life cut short because of some gruesome, tragic death or something like that, execution by natural disaster, whatever the case may be, if you have that happen to you but your soul is right with God, you have put your faith in Christ, guess what? It is well with your soul. You are with Jesus, and that is eternally better than living a long, peaceful, financially free life, dying peacefully, but then waking up and, and in hell you did lift up your eyes because you never put your faith in Jesus. If you die tragically but repent of your sin, you end up with glory, right? To die is gain because you were Jesus forever. If, we're, if you die without Christ, without true repentance of your sin, even after living a long life, you die in the lake of fire forever. Church, this is an urgent appeal Jesus gives to repent and believe the gospel before it's too late. Have you repented of your sin and put your uh, faith in Jesus to rescue from your sin? You know, there are many wicked people who are perpetrators of these murderous crimes. There are other pilots of today that we rightly look at as evil, right? But folks, the reality is the same sin that will bring them swift judgment one day condemns us as well. And I'm not saying your sin of lying or whatever it is is the same as murdering a bunch of people, but the, uh, your, your sin also qualifies, qualifies you for judgment, the same as some murderer's sin. Every person, including you and me, are born sinners. We're born with hearts that violate God's commands because, uh, because we want our own way. God is a holy God, and sin must be punished. Instead of focusing on the sin of others first, we better first be worried about, have we dealt with our sin problem? Can you imagine being in a busy traffic, driving in busy traffic, and it's dangerous and everything, and you look over and you see somebody texting, or you see somebody on the phone, they're distracted and things of that nature. And instead of you keeping your hands on the wheel, you're like, I can't believe that person checked. You take your hands off the wheel, you roll down the window, you're driving, but you don't have your hands on the wheel, and you're screaming at that person to stop texting and driving. That would be ridiculous. Why? Because you are ignoring that if I don't keep focused on this world, I'm going to die because of my own negligence. You need to first worry about have you repented of your sin? Jesus is not saying that you do not care about people who suffer and never question why things happen, but your first concern has to be, am I right with God? Have I turned from my sin? Jesus is urging you to repent now and put your faith in him before you perish. You say, what is repentance? This is the main call of the text, right? It's mentioned at least twice, alluded to in uh, the next parable here. That's we, we need to get that right. But first, what is not repentance? What is not genuine repentance? Repentance is not merely just an emotional response of feeling sorry or guilty because of your sin. It may very well include your emotions. But I've seen huge displays of sorrow over sin and, and people at the altar and things of that nation being emotion over sin or whatever, emotion just for emotion's sake, and then they leave 
and they live a life of unrepentant sin. Church, the danger is that you can have an experience where you feel sorry for your sin and yet walk away and your heart is really not changed. Jesus in Luke 6 describes a soil, a heart soil, who responds emotionally to the word and there's an initial emotional joyful response, but when the time of testing comes, there's no root there, so they fall away. Repentance is more than just emotional remorse over your sin. Repentance is also just not some cold, mechanical, religious confession with no actual heart or, uh, or mind change. You know, you have people that prayer, pr- pray these prayers of confessions in church as part of liturg- liturgy or repeated prayer. And they, and they just pray these prayers with hopes that the formula of these words themselves will change them and make them right before God without actually believing it in their heart and, 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 and changing Repentance is not just repeating words or saying some prayer without actually meaning and believing it in your heart. But what is repentance? Repentance is an inward change of heart and mind about your sin. To yes, where you're sorry for your sin or your remorse over your sin, but it's more than that. You turn from your sin to God in in forgiveness. Repentance reminds your mind and your will. Turning, being sorry and asking God for forgiveness for your sin and turning to Jesus to save you, to change you. Lord, this sin is evil. It's wrong. It offends you. Forgive me. I'm done living this way. I'm turning to Jesus in faith and forgiveness. Jesus, save me. Repentance shows up in a heart that rejects sin and embraces Christ as Savior where you are no longer the same. Not that you're perfect, nobody is, but your desires, your actions, your thinking is different than it was before. When you do sin, you you feel sorry about your sin. Truly repentant people actually continue to ask for forgiveness, right? In fact, 1 John says, if you say you do not have sin, you're a liar. So truly repentant uh, people actually continue to ask God for forgiveness because they want a heart pure before God. They want a relationship with God. It's it's unhindered. You do not become a child of God without first repenting and putting your faith in Christ. Repenting is how you become a child of God. Have you done that, folks? If not, according to Jesus' own words, listen, perishing awaits you. This is not hyperbole. This is not some, this is reality. You cannot escape the punishment of God without repenting and embracing the Son of God. Good things, folks. Jesus experiences the judgment that we all deserve. He actually was the only truly perfectly good person that ever had a bad thing happen to him, and it was for our sake. Jesus experienced the punishment of God, so you do not have to. So when you turn from your sin, when you ask God for forgiveness, Jesus completely saves you. He delivers and protects you from the eternal punishment. When you put your faith in in, in Jesus and you repent of your sin and put your faith in what he did on the cross to deliver you from your sin, you are forever delivered from punishment. If you are saved, you can be, if you have put your faith in Christ, you can be encouraged this morning. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. None. If you believe in Jesus, you do not perish, First uh, John says, John 3 says. But what? Have everlasting life. How long is everlasting life? Forever. If you are truly are a child of God, you don't have to worry or be scared about the judgment of God because Jesus took it all for you. And he will rescue you and bring you with him in glory. It is necessary for all of us to repent or face eternal judgment of God. Have you truly repented of your sin? Again, that doesn't mean you won't experience tragedy in this life. You may get killed or die unexpectedly or get some type of sickness, but your soul will be in paradise with Jesus forever. The time is now to repent. Now, I don't know if the next parable or the, uh, the next part, which is a parable, is, is told chrono- chronologically right after this event. Uh, I think it, it, it may be, but Luke organizes his material primarily thematically, and the theme of repentance before judgment is here in this parable as well, with an added element. See, if the evidence of genuine repentance 
is fruit bearing. Look at uh, verses 6 and 7. And he told them, told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? So a fig tree, as some of you guys know, some of you scholars are, uh, know that it, that is often used to represent Israel in various Old Testament texts, Jeremiah 24, verses 1 to 10, Micah 7, 1, Hosea 9. So commentators say that the parable depicts the nation on the edge of, judge, uh, uh, of judgment and God as a patient guy, allowing the nations one final chance to respond to faith in him. Now, despite having application to the nation of Israel, the parable has direct application to all those who claim to be followers or children of God. This was written to warn, this was written and spoken to warn professed followers of the one true God. So if you're here today and you are professing follower of Jesus, of the one true God, this parable is for you. We see an owner of a vineyard who plants a fig tree Three years ago, and he comes back to check on this fig tree. Hey, maybe he's been coming back year after year. He says to the vine dresser, I have been coming here for three years, and this stubborn tree has not produced any fruit at all. This is a waste of money, time, and a waste of good dirt, where we can actually take this out and put another tree that actually is going to bear fruit. How about we cut it down? The owner is ready to chop and destroy the tree because it's supposed to be a fig tree and it's not growing fruit. It ain't here for decoration, right? It's here to actually produce. The implication is clear that true children of God will bear fruit. The evidence of a person that is truly repentant is bearing fruit. If not, judgment will come. A visible, one commentator says, visible change must be seen in the life of one who claims to trust the Messiah. If there's no visible change, that person, like the figless tree, is judged. The evidence that you are truly a Christian is not that you say you're a Christian or believe in God or, or, uh, or that you're perfect, but there is evidence that you and others could point to that your life is transformed. Fruit bearing is displaying the virtues and good works that flow out of a person transformed by the gospel. Fruit bearing includes displaying the fruit of the spirit. That includes love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When you look at your life, do you see examples of those virtues, of self-control, of goodness, of gentleness? of kindness, of love, of peace, of patience. It, this fruit bearing includes having a heart that is sensitive to sin and continually ask for forgiveness. I don't understand that, you know, people who claim to be children of God, but they just go weeks and months not asking for forgiveness. If you are a true child of God, repentance and asking for forgiveness is part of your forever life. In fact, the more you get closer to God, the more sensitive you are to your own sin. Another thing that gospel fruit bearing includes is forgiving people, Jesus talks about earlier. Forgiven people, what? Forgive people. Blessed are the merciful, for you will receive mercy. Another area of bearing fruit is loving your brother and sister in Christ. Loving your neighbor, even if you don't like them or you don't agree with them or they get on your last nerves. Loving your neighbor. Loving even, Jesus says, your enemies. Being sacrificially compassionate to others. Being a giving person. Fruit bearing means partnering in Jesus' mission to make disciples. Sharing Jesus' words with other people. Showing the light of Jesus through your word and actions is a way that you bear fruit. Fruit bearing is not a simply attending church on occasion and saying you love Jesus. But the vast majority of your life you live for yourself. John the Baptist earlier 
And Luke says, bearing, he says, he tells, them, uh, tells the people that they need to bear fruit keeping with repentance, meaning that your life should be dramatically changed uh, when you repent and turn from sin. Are you striving to be a peacemaker? Are you keeping your life pure from sexual sin like fornication and adultery? You have, are you an advocate and, uh, for and pursue justice? Do you love kindness, walk humbly before your God? Listen, fruit bearing is not simply just turning away from sin, but it's pursuing godly living in heart, words, actions, and powered by the Spirit of God. The sobering part of this parable is that those professing believers who will bear no fruit will ultimately be judged as well. The owner of the vineyard, who is God, will cut you down, symbolizing judgment. Look at verses 8 and 9, though. And he answered them, Sir, let alone this year also, until I dig around it and put manure on it. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. So here, without going through all the details here, here is an example of the mercy and patience of God, right? Or this is Christ or God the Father, but regardless, he, God is gracious and slow to anger. And the, but there comes a time, though, when that patience runs out for you. Jesus has died for you. You have heard the gospel many times. Every day you live is another chance for you to repent and follow Jesus from the heart. Every day is another day that God has graciously given you to get right with him and evidence genuine repentance that comes with fruit bearing. God's goodness, he says, and patience is designed to lead us to repentance. But what ends up happening is, is that his goodness and patience, we presume upon his good, goodness and patience, and we think we got time. And we're apathetic. There's coming a day when he will pluck up the fruitless one who claims to be a follower, but is really not. And on that day, it will be too late. I've said this maybe the last couple times here, but don't let the fact that people think you are a follower of God stop you from being honest with yourself and honest with your God that you're clearly not and you need to trust Jesus. Put your faith in him and trust him. This is not a game, folks. Jesus loves you and giving you chance to repent. Come to him. Be honest with yourself and God. Repent and follow Jesus. It is only by the mercy of God that you breathe every day that we have not been tragically killed. I saw someone post, a guy I follow on social media, said leaving home and returning safely is an underrated, underrated blessing. It really is. Amen? Right? Just We don't think about just leaving to go to work or go to school and come back is an underrated blessing. Some of you guys, well, I'm on campus, so I'll just walk to class and go back to my dorm. But you could have been attacked by the squirrels or fell into the pond or something. Just kidding. But we, sometimes we, we take for granted just the everyday thing. We don't even know some of the things that God protected us from that we don't even see. God does not owe us, though, any more seconds to our life. But it's by his grace that he has allowed us to live this long. You never know when it's your time. Everyone must repent, and the time is now to repent but, or faith the wrath of God. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God if you don't know Jesus. You do not know when it's going to be your last day. Listen, you're not, we know this, but we need to think about it more. You're not promised tomorrow. Some of you guys know this story, but when I was in college, I don't know if I was in grad school or a senior, I know, it was either upperclassman or a first year of grad school. I was playing basketball with uh, a, a, an older friend of mine, and uh, really basketball friends, not close friends, but we, 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 we played basketball with each other a lot and talked a lot. And I'm at the university playing basketball. I probably should have been studying, but I was, you know, ball's life. And I'm playing basketball, and I'm talking on the sideline, and there's this older guy, like, man, he's probably like, uh, now, if you're older than this, you know, I'm not saying, saying you're old, but, you know, to be playing basketball, this is pretty old. He's like 56 or something like that. And he's balling out there. And we're sitting on the sideline. The guy tells me, uh, man, I can't wait till I'm that old. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I want to be out there just still balling just like him. He's talking about, you know, just future things. And, 
and, and uh, as it relates to sports and staying in shape and being out there for, you know, uh, on the court and, and balling with the young guys and things of that nature. The next day, you know, I'm going to work and I miss chapel. And a um, friend of mine, young lady, said, uh, did you hear about such and such? I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, I was just talking to him last night. He's like, he was killed in a motorcycle accident. I'm like, what? I was just... I was just hooping with this guy last night. We were just talking about future plans and, you know, us hooping when we're 60 and all that stuff. It's no, like, I just talked to him less than 24 hours ago, probably maybe less than 12 hours at that point. She's like, yeah, they announced it in chapel. And I would just remember being just blown away. Like, I, it was just, I was just in a state of shock. But I'm sure some of you have similar stories of people that, you knew, and all of a sudden, it was your last time talking to them, and they passed away. Something happened. Listen, you do not know when it is your time. God is gracious and allowed you time to repent. He is not, he's really not willing, willing that any of his people should perish, but all should come to repentance, as First Peter says. But he is not going to force you to repent. He reveals your need to repent and gives you Jesus as the answer. But listen, you must make the decision to put your faith in Jesus and truly follow him. Have you done that this morning? Does the evidence of that repentance show up in a changed life? Listen, church, I'm not talking about perfection here. I do not want to discourage people who have truly put their faith in Christ, but they're struggling and they're asking for forgiveness. You are a child of God. Jesus has paid it all. You are growing, and, and part of the sensitivity of sin is a sign that you're a child of God. But if you're living here saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, but you're living for yourself and you're unrepentant and you're in sin, there's no assurances from God's word that you are a child of God. But the good thing is that you can repent and make that right tonight, today, this morning. The time is now to repent and follow Jesus before it's too late. Jesus has fully absorbed the judgment and wrath of God on your behalf. Will you repent and put your faith in him this morning? The time is now.